us as agents who are building this global system through our individual choices and our corporate choices to actually align them and build them together. And so let's look again at some urbanism. This is an incredibly empowering urbanism. We have labeled it a slum only to put it down, only to argue why we should tear it up. This is a system that allowed in Dravi about 80 different migrant communities from different caste and ethnic backgrounds with very different commercial traditions doing different things from pottery, from leather, tannering, from apparel, many, many different things to co-locate them together to build an alliance with very powerful criminal organizations to prevent the government from tearing the place down and now has an economy of $1.5 billion. This is an incredibly empowering urbanism for one group of people who are seeking their future by moving to the city. Austin, Texas, there's an old urbanism there. It's called the downtown, the main street, right, in the United States. The malls come in, the downtown goes down, but then a bunch of people get together and they figure out as a community, a cultural community, let's make this a center of music and of culture in the United States. And now this downtown area is one of the great destinations uh, in our country and one of the great revival stories, of uh, the revival of, uh, of an old urbanism. Uh, Barcelona uh, is a, a case I uh, devote a, a chapter to, but how we take European slums, what were European slums, and revive them and make them the most vibrant districts, the center of youth culture uh, and fashion and design in Europe, or Harvard Square uh, on the left, uh, a, a group of academic scholarly research interests and cultural interests that find a way to build a unit of the city together that's extremely replicable. And this comes out of that old urbanism of the, of the madrasa, uh, from the Middle East, um, from even pre-Ottoman times. And Coritiba, Brazil. How did they take a city that was sprawling out and a hundred, more than a hundred bus companies that are kind of run as little quasi-mafias that are unregulated and a bunch of commercial interests and a bunch of landowners and land speculators and channel their, them together into a corridor urbanism that has a modal share in transit that's greater than every European city? of any size, greater than Tokyo with its subway system, and that earns a profit, that generates a profit. Think about that, a transit system that generates a profit and has done so year after year. So another instance of the alignment of what were competing strategies into a common strategy for building the city. After leaving Italy and you know, doing the local Agenda 21 effort for about 10 years, I went back to the best practices database because I was curious why wasn't Local Agenda 21 sufficiently changing the way that cities were developing? And I won't belabor this too much, but I, I, what I realized is when you look at the best practice databases and, and you put it on a spectrum from cities where there's an intense agency, a lot of participation, very user-centered design, customized, very adaptable forms and utilities, to the far end of the spectrum where we have this kind of standardized batch production of certain models of city building, which is what your developers bring to your cities today. Um, it's an industry centered. It, the user is not engaged in the process of design. It's standardized. It's very rigid form. It's very capital intensive. If you take the best practices from the global best practice databases and you put them, map them on this spectrum, what you end up with is that you find that it's actually the urbanisms that we're celebrating, but it's not the urbanisms that we're building. Okay, so we know and we do best practices so we can somehow reverse engineer this and do it in our cities, but we're not really doing that. We're building this by and large. And in particular, it's when we have community-based traditions of urbanism and we as local governments and private sector engage with it on an institutional basis that we create the Corachivas and the Barcelonas and the Chicagos, the great success stories of urban transformation in the last 20 years. And now we see it happening in Silicon Valley. We see an industrial community that was, uh, thought it was adequate to accept the suburban model. And they're saying to compete in the world, we need to create two new kinds of urbanism. And they've organized themselves as an urbanist community with local government, industry, the labor unions, with the design community. And they're creating a corridor through the city, transforming this to this, kind of Coritiba-like, and transforming these uh, uh, industrial parks here. My, laser's gone, into a new, what they call, innovation district urbanism. But this is what we're building. And my argument is, but there isn't an urbanism where we're not focused on inventing urbanisms or renewing our traditional urbanisms. There is no strategy. 
What we've done is divided the building and the expansion of the cityscape from the people who will use it, from the people who have a strategy for it, and we're actually disempowering ourselves as we go, in addition to creating something that environmentally is not very sustainable. Um, the big picture is in the Pearl River Delta. It could be in Las Vegas. That's why I just opposed those two. And you'll see this with high-rise development, with shopping malls. What we're getting is a standardized product, five or six or seven forms of product that are tweaked a little bit. Here we've got Feng Shui orientation in the Pearl River Delta, but it's the basically the same thing, and that is what most of the cityscape is that we're building today. So the question is, can there be an ecological urbanism? And when we talk about an ecological urbanism coming to the scenario, it has to be at all scales of the city. It has to be at this big scale as well as at the micro scale itself. So let's just look about that. And we might take some cues from this other view of the planet. How does this organize itself? Well, when we stretch that one out, what we begin to see from the satellites is we got our first perspective that the world is organized into these globally extended communities, self-organizing communities of ecology. So we have the biomes, the major communities of life on the planet um, with characteristic plant and animal life. I want you to create a parallel here in your life to this urban system we talked about. Yeah, so in our cities, we have a characteristic plant and animal life, a common climate, similar environmental conditions. So we can take some lessons perhaps from the biome, which is structured in a coherent way from the super micro, from what happens technologically speaking within the leaf to what happens at very vast scales of a uh, continental rainforest. And we ask ourselves, well, how does that all work? Well, it all works together to create something called an atmosphere that has a certain chemical balance in it, mix of compounds and uh, um, elements in the atmosphere which then allows an energy balance to be established on the planet to maintain a consistent climate. And that climate starts here and it scales up to a global system that allows itself to sustain itself. So what would an ecological urbanism look like? Here we see it at its many scales. I won't go through the details of the unique functions of each of those scales. But the question is, can we look at the scales of our city building and transform what is an extractive system and unecological on the right into something that's more like a productive system, an ecological system on the, on the left. Let's start with what happens inside the basic unit of our city within the home, let's say. And we have in our cities um, evidence of all kinds of initiatives that are successful in allowing families to make choices about living differently, consuming differently. And these things are starting to scale up. So the question I put to you here at Ickley is can we do more of that? Can we do more ecological footprinting, actually having families decide they're going to change their consumption patterns? You know, I'd ask is Mayor uh, Pam O'Connor here from San Santa Monica. Are you here? Yeah? Can you change the, dramatically the volume of water that people use within a home through behavioral change? Can we do more of that? Well, Santa Monica has done that in a tremendous way. So yes, yes, we can do that. Um, and then we look at, OK, the surface of what goes on in there, the skin of our city. And we see that we can actually develop new systems to put that skin, to make that a living, productive skin. And we see these buildings up, going up all over the place. And we can ask a, a Lord Mayor Solomon from Freiburg, can we do more than that? Can we do this? Can this become the regular way in which we do things? And we can see in Freiburg that there's a city, I don't know what the percentage are, but where it's scaling itself up. So yeah, we can do more of this at this scale, changing what was a dead skin to a living, productive skin. And then we look at the individual unit. And let's just say for our purposes, like a tree, it's a house. And what is the system of the house? Well, what allows that to extract less, to produce more, to recycle its resources internally uh, in order to sustain itself? Well, we have passive housing which is this new, a system, a kind of a no-brainer system that takes heat from the ground and creates heat exchange and air exchange systems and uses insulation and uses passive solar and active solar. And it creates a system that allows us to dramatically reduce the energy demand uh, within a building. And so we could ask Hans Mörninghoff or we could ask our friends in, in Finland or we could ask our friends in Sweden, can we build more passive housing? Can this be scaled up? And I think the answer is you're being quiet, and maybe that's a no. I doubt it's a no. Of course we can do more of this. We can scale this up. 
And then we, let's look about the corridor. So we have a bunch of trees, a little ecosystem along a stream, and then we've got uh, Indoravi 